Christmas has always, and I mean always, been my favorite season. I am absolutely insufferable when it comes to the Christmas season. I listen to Christmas music, typically starting in July. <laughs> you can check my Spotify list. I'm not, li- I'm not lying. Christmas music will start typically in July for me. It's a kind of like a six-month uh, amp up to Christmas season. So I, I start listening to Christmas, and I beg uh, my poor wife, Kelsey, to put up our Christmas tree on November 1st every single year. I would probably leave, did I hear an amen? <laughs> That's right, brother. I knew we connected. I knew it. I would put the tree up. All, I would keep it up all year round if it was up to me. I just Christmas is my favorite season. Uh, there isn't a single thing about Christmas that, honestly, I don't love. I, I love everything about the food at Christmas time. I, I love everything about family. I love everything about tradition. All of it. I, I, I love everything that comes. All the trappings that come with Christmas. Growing up, in fact, I'll be a little transparent here, growing up I would get so excited about Christmas that I wouldn't even sleep on Christmas Eve. Uh, I would stay up all night long and I would watch the 24-hour marathon of a Christmas story. Uh, I don't know if it's still played 24 hours, but it used to be played 24 hours. I had every line memorized. I could tell you where everything was happening in that movie. I would just stay up all night long and every hour on the hour... I'd creep into my parents' bedroom, and I'd wake them up to let them know what time it was. <laughs> hey, Mom, Dad, it's, it's midnight. Okay, go to bed. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hey, Dad, it's three in the morning now. Can we get up and start celebrating Christmas? Go to bed. And th- this would go on every single hour. And I'd be lying if I told you that that tradition stopped when I was young. I, I was probably 17, and it just became fun to me to... It's midnight. Can we get up and start celebrating Christmas? And it was often met with anger and uh, putting me back in my bedroom. But I just, I love Christmas. And you see, it it wasn't the idea of Christmas presents that that excited me. It's it's not the materialism. I'm, I'm being honest with you. It's all the trappings of Christmas Day that got me so excited to begin celebrating it. From from getting up early and having a big breakfast with my family, to having a, a um, spending time with my family, hearing wonderful Christmas music, having this big, wonderful lunch uh, with my family, waiting for family to come over, and having this big dinner with my family. And as I'm saying this, I'm starting to realize Christmas is probably more about food for me than anything else. But everything that comes with Christmas, I just absolutely love it. And do you want to know what I particularly love about Christmas? At, at the risk of sounding religiously pious, it's celebrating the incarnation of our King, Jesus. I am, I'm thankful that we follow, as a church, uh, the traditional church calendar, calendar. We observe each movement throughout the year, but for me, there is something extraordinary about celebrating Christmas with the incarnation at the forefront of our festivities as a church. It's the one time a year we get to celebrate as one body, the coming of Emmanuel, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And each year, as we celebrate the incarnation, we reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God taking on flesh and dwelling with his people. And in so, we think of the incarnation and we make a beeline for the cross. We think of the incarnation and we immediately run to the cross. Church, this is not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing whatsoever. I mean, we can't get to the cross without the incarnation, correct? Christ was born to die. Our Christmas songs reflect this very thought. Hear this from Hark the Herald Angels Sing, speaking of the incarnation to the cross. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. And then later on, in that very same song, we sing this line. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing. As we celebrate the incarnation, we look to the cross. The incarnation invariably leads us to the cross as Christians. Today, though, I want us to dwell 
no pun intended, a little longer on the incarnation. We celebrate this every single year. We rejoice that Jesus was born of a virgin called Emmanuel. He was the sign that signifies that God is indeed with his people. But we don't often think about what it means that Christ's birth, particularly born of a virgin and given the name Emmanuel, fulfilled a prophecy given hundreds of years prior. What does it mean that this was fulfilled? And why was the sign of Emmanuel given in the first place? The answer to this question is, is going to be the central idea of my sermon today. And honestly, it's the central idea of the text that we're going to be reading. This idea is that God gives the sign of Emmanuel to declare his presence with his people. If you're a person that likes to take notes, that's something that you could write down. God gives the sign of Emmanuel to declare his presence with his people. And God's presence, God's presence isn't just relational proximity to his people. It's not just this physical closeness. While it it definitely does include God's closeness to his people, we will actually see from Isaiah today the theological fullness of this prophecy, of this sign and promise for God's people. So together, let's, let's turn to Isaiah 7. Start at Matthew, take a hard left, flip through. If you hit the Psalms, you've gone too far. Let's go to Isaiah 7. I'll begin reading Isaiah 7, verse 1, and ending in verse 17. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Ahaz, go out, sorry, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to Ahaz, you and Shirashabab, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of, Rem, of, son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord, It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the, since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. God gives the sign of Emmanuel to declare his presence with his people. It's in this passage that we find the prophecy of Emmanuel given to his people. Later we hear it in Matthew, but here it's where it's given. This prophecy of Emmanuel given to the people of God, Judah, the house of David. Now, 
we start reading this, there's so many names, there's so many kind of nations that we, we get a little bit confused and we start thinking, what's going on in this passage? We can actually uh, somewhat reconstruct the context of this passage by using other passages in the Old Testament. So we can draw from Isaiah, we can draw from 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings, and we can have more than a general idea of what has precipitated this event. A few hundred years after Israel has split into two kingdoms, the the north remaining Israel with the capital Samaria, and the southern kingdom named Judah, capital Jerusalem, the king of Judah finds himself and his nation in, in quite a pickle. Unlike many of his kingly predecessors, Ahaz leads Judah during, a, during tumultuous times as a nation. And during this time, Assyria grew to become the world power that it was, dominating nations around it, including eventually making Judah its vassal, vassal state. Prior to Ahaz, other kings were able to lead and fend off from Assyria, but Ahaz had other plans. Judah, at this point, has already suffered many defeats and death from raging nations around it, primarily Syria and Israel. And the constant threat of regional war threatened Ahaz, uh, threatened him so much that he decided to align himself with Assyria. Syria, uh, Assyria. Syria and Israel were a threat, and Assyria was a large threat. Ahaz had to do the unthinkable. He could not trust Syria, he could not trust Israel, his closest neighbors, to form an alliance against Assyria, so he decided to take the old adage, make the enemy of my enemy my friend. Ahaz entered into an agreement with Assyria in order to find protection from Syria and Israel under the mighty wing of Assyria's army, government, and gods. This decision proves Uh, throughout the book of Isaiah to not only be immediately detrimental, but deadly in the long term. But this wasn't Ahaz's only problem, giving allegiance to Assyria. Uh, This means that he was giving money, paying dues to Assyria, and they were giving up their independence. You know, the typical governmental things that take place. But according to 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, Ahaz observed and participated in the religious practices of all the other countries around him. Perhaps he was doing this to draw some type of luck from all the false gods, all the false deities around them. Once Ahaz and Judah joined as a satellite state of Assyria, Ahaz began worshiping and observing the religious practices of Assyria too. Ahaz was not monotheist. He was not a monotheist. He worshipped the gods of everybody around him. And as, and as Assyria took over, he said, you know what? Whoever your gods are too, let me worship them as well. He clearly believed in many gods and was grasping at anything he could for protection. A new country comes along, a new country has new gods, and Ahaz says, who's your gods? Bring them in. You guys are strong, so obviously your god is strong. Let me worship them with you. I love how uh, one Old Testament scholar, uh, his name's Paul House, he describes this for Ahaz. He says, Ahaz proved to be a man of his times, for he seemed to believe in many gods, and that the power of the nations served them, uh, the power of the nations demonstrated the power of their gods. So if a country became powerful, their god was powerful, he wanted to worship them. To his way of thinking then, Yahweh must have been very weak if Judah was always so vulnerable. Not only was he not a a monotheist, but he uh, was not even particularly loyal to his own God, the own God of his own nation, choosing to worship other gods before Yahweh. Ahaz was so caught up in the observance of other religious practices and worship of other gods that the God of Judah, the, the God of David, the God of Abraham, was put on the back burner for Judah and for Ahaz. Ahaz would rather turn to Assyria for help than turn to God for help. This is where our passage picks up. Judah is facing impending war from Syria and Israel and had placed all of their trust in their sovereign protector, not Yahweh. They placed all of their trust in their sovereign protector, Assyria. Remember, God gives the sign of Emmanuel to declare his presence with his people 
one of which the sign of Emmanuel is given to calm the fears of God's people. In the days of Ahaz, the the son of Jotham, reading through these first couple verses here, uh, you start to see fear creep in. As I said, war was upon Judah. It wasn't just rumors of war. It was actual war. Israel and Syria weren't planning, uh, weren't just planning attack. They were waiting to attack. They were there. They were breathing down the neck of Ahaz and Judah. Israel and Syria were foaming at the mouth, ready to attack. It's like a scene from, from many war, uh, wartime movies where armies are just standing across from each other waiting for the call sign to attack. This is what Judah, as they're looking out, they see a battle on the horizon. Syria and Israel were in position. They were ready to annihilate Judah. We're not sure from the language of this passage what caused them to wait, whether they were just kind of regrouping, regrouping or they were uh, getting... Uh, kind of more ammunition or or planning for their operation, but nonetheless, this image sticks. They were standing in front of Judah, ready to attack. They were so close that Judah could see them, they could smell them, and Judah waited with bated breath. Ahaz and Judah were fearful. And the scriptures here actually say, they use this illustration that they were like trees of the forest shake before the wind. I remember a couple of years ago, Kelsey and I went on vacation with her parents and we went to Florida. And, you know, as we do every couple of years, we have the same spot in Florida that we love to go to. And the weather is always nice, uh, except for this one year, uh, five out of the six days we were there, it, it stormed horribly. And uh, so we were stuck within our hotel room for many days just watching TV. So nothing better than spending a lot of money to go someplace nice and not be able to leave your hotel room. But I remember specifically one day, sitting on the balcony with my father-in-law, the, the rain is coming down horrendous. We're, we're looking out on the ocean and we're seeing this, this storm just rolling through and you're literally seeing palm trees turned horizontal. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking just little, uh, little movements here and there. I'm talking they were absolutely moving. Trees swaying under incredible pressure is an illustration that scripture uses to correlate to the hearts of Ahaz and the hearts of of Judah. I also remember, uh, as I get my illustrations mixed around, I remember uh, one time when I lived alone to illustrate fear. Uh, I lived in Lynchburg, Virginia. I was on my own. Uh, I was hours away from my family and um, power went out one week. And it just didn't go out. It happened to be one of the hottest weeks of the year. The the average temperature was like 105, 106 degrees every single day. So I had no power for a week, no air conditioning for a week. I uh, had to open my windows every night, all night long, just to get some kind of cross breeze. But it was just just absolutely miserable at my wit's end with how hot I am and no power's coming back on. And then our neighborhood started to have break-ins. And every single night, someone else's house was broken into. And one night, I'm laying in bed, miserable, trying to sleep, covered in sweat, and I start hearing the jingle jangle of my doors. And fear absolutely just sets in for me. And not just like normal fear, but utter fear. I had no idea what to do. So I stood up. I grabbed my Louisville Slugger. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. It was a miniature Louisville Slugger. It was like one of the like, shop ones that you buy. So like, I wasn't walking around the house like this. I was walking around the house like this with this miniature Louisville Slugger. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to give them a good bruise with this tiny bat, but I'm not going to break anything. I turned on lights. I opened my back door. I saw people. I started yelling, and they started to take off. I turned around. I shut the door. I locked it. I fell on the floor, and I just I couldn't catch my breath. I was absolutely scared. I've never actually been that scared in my life. Uh, my heart was literally, not metaphorically, literally beating out of my chest. Adrenaline was at an all-time high, and I could not shake fear. Have you ever felt fear like that before? Now imagine being a nation that is facing down your surrounding enemies and your enemies are about to attack you. Your heart's not pitter-pattering. It's packing its bags and running away. 
And the question that, that comes up through this text as we think of this is, why was Judah so fearful? And I don't mean to ask that flippantly. I'm really asking that. Why were they so fearful? I, I realize that major war was, was uh, about to break out. Judah had already suffered great loss prior to this event. But the question still stands. Why were they so fearful? I mean, after all, they are Judah. They're the house of David. They're God's promised people. Haven't they heard the stories of old of God's faithfulness? Don't they know the history of their people? Can't they recall the promises given to them from God? Whether or not they knew those things, I can't tell you. But I can tell you this. Judah was fearful because they had no hope. Their hope was misplaced. Instead of leaning into the everlasting arms of their covenantal father, God, Ahaz turned his nation into the ever-destructive arms of false hope. Judah chose to trust in earthly protection instead of heavenly protection. And we see through this text, the text, the results here are, are obvious. And it's, it's easy for us to, to point our fingers and say, Judah was, was so incredibly dumb on what they did. They're the people of God. How could they do that? They're so incredibly dumb. How could they ever put their hope in earthly protection? And brothers and sisters, I tell you, the moment you start pointing your finger at Judah, turn that hand around and begin to point it at yourself. Because sure, it's easy to criticize ancient Near East thought and practice, but it's another to deny that we don't do the same thing in our lives. We may not be facing the threat of war, but we do willingly choose to put our hope in other things to save us. We put our hope in government. We put our hope in money. We put our hope in jobs. We put our hope in gifts. We put our hope in intelligence. And the list could go on and on of the things that we place our hope in. We have all, at different times and at different ways, put our hope in something other than God for his guidance, for his protection, and his love. And when the bottom falls out, when government fails us, when money fails us, when jobs fail us, we are fearful people. When an election goes the wrong way, when we lose our job, when the stock market crashes, we respond in fear. Brothers and sisters, this this is not the way of followers of Christ. Our hope is in nothing less than the perfect love of God. We see that time and time again in the New Testament. Christ calms our fears. Christ removes our doubt. And Christ is our hope. Here in Isaiah, Ahaz and Judah are fearful because they don't have steadfast hope in something that can save them. Yet God still gives them a sign. God still gives a sign to show that his presence removes fear for his people. The sign of Emmanuel calms the fears of God's people. And as we continue on, we will see how this develops. Verses 3 through 9. The sign of Emmanuel calls God's people to faith. So we've just seen in the first two verses, the sign of Emmanuel does call Uh, to calm people's fears. Now we see it calls God's people to faith. One of the key verses from this section says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Background to this again, Isaiah goes out to meet Ahaz at their their watering hole and he gives him the, the assurances of God. In response to Judah's fear, God sends his prophet Isaiah to meet Ahaz and give him assurance. Man, isn't God good? Isn't God good? In the midst of fear, God still gives assurance. He sees his people are fearful and lack hope, and yet he still gives a word of assurance. Isaiah and his son, uh, which the the son's name uh, roughly translates to a remnant will return, meet Ahaz at the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Ahaz is standing over Judah's water supply. And it wasn't until Hezekiah that Judah had a self-sustaining supply. So so Ahaz is looking at his water supply, trying to assess the situation. 
water, uh, water supplies were often the first thing that were attacked in war. It, you could literally dry out people when you attacked a, a new area. You removed a, a source of sustenance for them. Isaiah meets Ahaz and gives the Lord's assurance to him and his people. He says, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. In response to the frightened hearts of Judah, God's assurance tells them to calm down. God's assurance says, don't be afraid of raging nations. Not only does he say not to be afraid, but he calls them smoldering stumps, smoldering stumps of firebrands. Somewhat of an antiquated uh, analogy to, to call trees. But um, when I was young, my parents bought a swimming pool for our backyard. It was really neat. We were like the only people in our development that had a swimming pool. Parties every summer, all the friends were around, but we had this pool. And part of my parents installing the swimming pool uh, was removing three or four giant maple trees in our backyard. Uh, these trees were so big, and they, they cast a nonstop shadow on our backyard. They kept the pool cold, and we constantly had to clean the pool because things fall off of trees. And it, it, it was a mess, so my parents said, we're going to remove these, these giant maple trees. And I couldn't fathom how these trees were going to come down. I mean, these, these were humongous trees, and for an 11-year-old staring at these trees that were probably over 100 feet uh, high, had been there for who knows how long, was staring, going, how are these massive things going to come down? They weren't tiny trees by any stretch of the imagination. But those trees came down, and they came down awfully quick. And what was left were three or four tiny little stumps of what used to be tree. The night after the trees were moved, we actually started to burn the stumps out of the ground completely so that there'd be, there'd be no uh, vestiges of these trees that were in our backyard. And I remember staring at these, these stumps and thinking how big and strong they once were, and now they're just smoldering remnants of trees. They no longer cast shadow in our backyard, but were now insignificant to the grand scheme of our swimming activities. This is the image that should be in Judah's head. They were so fearful that their hearts were shaking like trees, and now God says, these nations aren't trees. These nations are just burning stumps in your backyard. God says, don't be afraid, for your enemies are smoldering stumps. They used to cast a shadow over your nation. They used to loom over you. Now they are tiny, little, smoldering remnants of what they used to be. Take heart, people of God. And to strengthen his assurance, God gets specific. I love this. He says, it will not stand. Speaking in the indicative, God is saying, it will not stand and it will not come to pass. Speaking of the war and destruction that Judah think is, is upon them. Through the prophet Isaiah, God recounts the headship line of Syria and Israel. He says this, catch this, this is, this is super important for us. He says, the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Likewise, he says, the head of Ephraim, which is Israel, is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. In other words, we ask this question, who is in charge of Syria? Well, through Damascus, their capital, they have King Rezin. Well, who is in charge of Israel? Well, through Samaria, their capital, they've got the son of Remaliah. Without having to say it to Judah, God implicitly says, who is your head? In doing so, God reminds Judah, these other countries have kings over them. I am your God. I am the head of your nation. Those other nations are led by men. Your nation is led by God Almighty. Therefore, Judah has no reason to fear because God is leading and will not allow Israel and Syria to destroy them. God's covenant promises to the line of David are in full display here. War and destruction will not come. Why? Because God says so. I will not let it happen. To cap off his, his assurance uh, to his people, God says, if you don't stand firm in faith, you won't stand at all. 
God is calling through that statement, God is calling his people to place their faith in him. By saying, if you don't stand firm in faith, you won't stand at all. God's calling his people, put your faith in me. I'm leading your nation. Never, never a truer statement has been uttered to a group of people who have misplaced their hope in earthly protection. God has reminded his people that he is in charge and that he is faithful to keep his covenant promises with his people. If you have no faith, you have nothing at all. If your faith is placed in anything other than God, you are standing on nothing. And as one of my favorite hymns reminds us as Christians, we say, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. A firmly placed faith in God, a firmly placed faith in God provides us the footing to live out our lives daily in a full trust and assurance in the goodness and grace of God. I'm going to say that again because this is so important for us to hold on to. A firmly placed faith in God provides us the footing to live out our lives daily in full trust and assurance in the goodness and grace of God. Without that faith, without that faith, our best attempts to stand on our own are always met with overwhelming weight of debt or of doubt and fear. Without a properly placed faith, we're met with doubt and fear. In Isaiah, God calls his people to faith. Christ, in fulfilling this prophecy and conquering death on the cross, enables us to come to God in full assurance of faith. Once clothed in Christ's righteousness, our feeble attempts at life are no more. And we live out our faith, not with fear and doubt, but with hope and trust, rooted in the God who guides us. In the coming passage, we see that God finally gives his people a sign. It's the sign of Emmanuel, the sign of God's presence with his people. And though the the sign hasn't been given yet in this passage, we've we've already read the passage, so we know the ending, we can see backwards how the sign of Emmanuel calms the fears of God's people. We look backwards and see how the sign of Emmanuel calls God's people to faith. Now we look to the immediate passage to see how the sign of Emmanuel displays God's faithfulness to his people. Let's continue on. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Isaiah saying, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? He's speaking to the entire congregation of Judah at that point. The the language switches from a singular you to a plural you. We don't have that in English, except for like in Kentucky and Alabama, people say y'all. So reading this passage, we're, we're thinking here as he switches from just talking to Ahaz and talking to all of Judah, he says, Hear then, O house of David, all of you, is it too little for y'all to weary men that you, y'all weary my God also? I mean, that would preach in Kentucky. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And here's the sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Up to this point, God has called for his people to put put away their fear and to put their faith and trust in him. Now, as a sign of his covenant faithfulness, God allows Ahaz to ask for a sign to validate what has been said. So God says, don't fear. Don't fear whatsoever. I'm not going to allow this to happen. Stand firm in faith. Come to faith in me. Now ask me of a sign. I will give you a sign to show you my faithfulness. God is willing to give a sign to show what he says will come to pass. You would think that that God, the creator of the universe, speaking is enough, that his majesty needs no sign to verify his works, but yet God's kindness shines through to Judah and allowing for their fearful and doubting hearts to be given a physical sign. In fact, God doesn't just say, ask for a sign. He says, ask for a miraculous sign. 
Now, I'm not making this up. This is coming from the text. The exact words he says are, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. God is saying there are no limits to the sign that Isaiah can ask for. There's no height nor depth that would close off the miraculousness of the sign that you can ask for. Nothing is off the table for God's sign. The miraculousness of the sign means to signify God's word. The sign can't be confused with anything else. It's such a miraculous sign that you can't confuse it for anything else. It's not like a random sign that they would see and think, hmm, is God trying to tell me something right now? No, this, this sign, as, as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, this is big. God enabled Ahaz to ask for whatever he wanted to be a sign. So naturally, Ahaz asks for a sign. No. You would think he would ask for a sign, but he doesn't. Not only does Ahaz not ask for a sign, he denies it. By quoting scripture, Deuteronomy 6, Ahaz says, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. At first glance, you may think this is a holy and pious answer, but context tells us otherwise. Ahaz was already worshiping gods of, of surrounding nations. Ahaz was not adverse to giving dues to power, powerful nations to pay dues to their gods. But the god, his god, Judah, must be weak. In feigning piety here, in feigning piety, Ahaz quotes scripture. And just a side note, knowing and quoting scripture doesn't mean you're holy, right? Knowing and quoting scripture doesn't mean you're holy. Just look back at the garden and hear Satan's words, quoting and knowing scripture. Most likely here, Ahaz was politically motivated. He's answering with, with Deuteronomy 6 to be politically motivated with Isaiah. God's chosen prophet is standing before him, speaking, thus says, says the Lord, to give him sign, to give him assurance, and not wanting to upset the religious within his nation, Ahaz likely uses scripture to get himself out of the situation. Ahaz would rather trust in the protection of Assyria than trust in the protection from God. Ahaz would rather trust in his own way out of a problem. Ahaz would rather trust in his own way out of a problem than looking to the author of creation for the solution. This may come to many of you as a surprise, uh, but when I was younger, um, I, was quite, I was quite disobedient as a kid. And uh, I was constantly in trouble from my parents, constantly pushing the limits. Now, my, my older brother, uh, I'm pretty sure he never got yelled at, grounded, or spanked um, because that all came out on me. I was the exemplar spanked uh, little boy. My problems here, my, my problems in being a disobedient child always stemmed from the fact that I didn't listen to my parents. Children, listen. Listen to your parents. But my problems always stem from the fact that I did not listen to what my parents had to say. I always wanted to find my own way out of a situation. Whatever my parents said to do, I would do the exact opposite. My parents would say, we will handle this problem. And I would say, not before I do. You see, I always wanted my own solution. I didn't want to trust or rely on my parents. And one example that I can distinctly remember being a, a very young boy was I had this toy motorcycle that I absolutely loved. I played with this motorcycle every single day until one day the front wheel broke off of the motorcycle and I was absolutely distraught. And uh, I took it to my dad and my, my parents were, they were busy. We were getting ready to go someplace. And I took it there and I said, my motorcycle broke. Can you try and fix it? And my dad said, yeah, I, we can just super glue that back on. It'll, it'll be fine. We don't have time to do it right now. I'll do it later. Which now that I'm thinking about, that's his fault for saying we'll do it later because I took the situation into my own hands. My dad said, there's a solution. I said, well, I'm going to do it. I know where the super glue's at. You guys are busy. I'm going to figure this one out. And I did. I figured it out. I super glued that wheel back on the motorcycle. And in doing so, I covered my hand in super glue, stuck the wheel in it, 
stuck it back on the motorcycle, and I was done. Until I realized I super glued my hand to our kitchen table. And at that moment, serendipitous moment, my parents saw what I had done, and I tried to run. And when your hand is super glued to a kitchen table, you can't get very far. My timeline was better than my parents, and the results of not trusting them proved to not be wise for me. My parents, like I said, saw just at the moment that I glued my hand to our kitchen table, had to rip it off, it ripped off part of the wood of the table, I I had wood pieces all over my hand, I had a, a bruised backside related to that instance. And, and I ate a lot of humility that night of not listening and not trusting in my parents. I super glued my hand to a kitchen table. My own self-reliance, both metaphorically and literally, glued me to my punishment. Though my parents would have fixed the situation, I looked for my own answers and thus putting me in a situation that I should not have been in. If I would have just trusted my parents' guidance, I would not have been in that situation. Similarly, but on a much grander scale, Ahaz's response shouldn't be surprising to us. He hasn't showed trust or faith in God at this point. Ahaz and Judah would rather trust in their own devices. They'd rather trust in their own way of salvation than that of the covenant-keeping God of Judah. Ahaz, on behalf of Judah, declares their blatant disobedience towards God. We don't need a sign from you, God. We'll figure this out. In the midst, in the midst of the unfaithfulness of God's people, in the midst of unfaithfulness, in the midst of disobedience, God gives a sign to show his steadfast faithfulness to his people. Not only does the sign of Emmanuel intend to calm the fears of God's people, not only does it intend to call God's people to faith, but it also displays in beautiful grandeur God's faithfulness to his people. Despite the disobedience of God's people, God shows his faithfulness by giving a sign. And this sign is not like any other sign. And in, in my opinion, this is, it's quite possibly the most miraculous sign that we see in all of Scripture. A virgin gives birth to a son and names him Emmanuel, which the New Testament tells us means God with us. What is more miraculous than a virgin birth? Go ahead, I'll wait. What's more miraculous than a virgin birth? I know I didn't pay attention to health class all that much in high school, but I do know that giving birth requires two people. A virgin birth is quite possibly the most miraculous sign that we will ever see. The virgin birth as a miraculous sign to show God's faithfulness to be with his people calms their fears. Simultaneously, it calls them to faith and is one of the most important ideas of our Christian faith. God dwelling with his people. God dwells with his people. This is not a new idea. The the Old Testament is steeped in this idea. God dwelled with his people in the garden. God dwelled with his people through the wilderness, then through the tabernacle, and eventually the temple. God's presence was a big deal to his people. Here, God is promising, calm your fear, put your faith in me. I am faithful to you. I will provide you deliverance from your enemies, and I will give you a miraculous sign to verify my work. The boy, will be, uh, the boy b- born of that sign will be na- named Emmanuel because I will be with my people. God's promised presence is nothing short of spectacular. God's promised presence is nothing short of spectacular for us. God's presence should calm all fear. It should drive God's people to fall on their hands and feet in worship. Just think back to Isaiah 6, when Isaiah met God in the throne room. What was his his response? God's presence drove Isaiah to his face on the ground, the Sheer idea of God dwelling with his people is not a small, insignificant matter. Ahaz was given the opportunity to ask for a sign uh, 
that would signify all that God has promised to his people. God will deliver his people from their turmoil. The the disobedience of Ahaz and Judah doesn't deter God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness is bigger than the disobedience of his people. God will remain steadfast even as his people turn their backs on him. The sign of Emmanuel to Judah and to us points to God's amazing faithfulness. Even though his people are disobedient and trust in their own ways, God provides deliverance. This was true for Judah, and it's true for us. The sign and promise of God's dwelling presence should be on the forefront of our minds all year long, not just at Christmas. We can go around this room one by one and name instances where God's faithfulness to us remained steadfast, even in our disobedience. We could go person by person and recount and rejoice of God's faithfulness to us. Even in the times when things are so hard and we didn't know how to take another step, God's faithfulness proved true. I love the old poem about feet in the sand. Do you all know this one? The old poem about feet in the sand? It says something along the lines of, you walked with me and and I could see two footprints. And then when there was only one set of footprints and times were bad, it was actually you who were carrying me. Some of you may have this in a picture frame above your toilet at your house. The reason I love this poem is because it's just not true. It's not true, brothers and sisters. The poem would be more accurate, as one of my friends once said, if it depicted a set of footprints walking and another set being dragged down the beach. Because the reality is, in our disobedience, God doesn't just carry us down the beach. He drags us down the beach for his good and his glory. God's presence calms the fears of his people It calls his people to faith. And the sign of Emmanuel displays in perfect splendor his faithfulness. I promise I'm rounding third. And lastly, the sign of Emmanuel is perfectly, perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the sermon, I said, what is the significance of Jesus fulfilling this prophecy? I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about the context of Isaiah and Ahaz and Judah. Uh, There's a lot of debate, honestly, that talk about what type of fulfillment is actually found in this prophecy. We know that the Gospel of Matthew says that Jesus fulfilled it, but is, is that it? Some scholars would argue that there was a fulfillment in the time of Isaiah, that there actually was a a boy born of a virgin then, and that Jesus was the typological fulfillment, the perfect fulfillment of that to come later. Talking about the type and the antitype, and how does Jesus fulfill it? Some call this a fuller understanding of the prophecy. We don't have time to talk about the nuances of validity or whether or not we should understand this. Nor is it really helpful for my aim today in in talking about this passage. What we do know is that Matthew 1, right at the beginning, depicts Jesus as the fulfillment of this prophecy. But Jesus isn't just any fulfillment of this prophecy. He is the perfect fulfillment of Isaiah 7. He is the perfect fulfillment. The, The virgin birth of Christ and name Emmanuel, Emmanuel, perfectly fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. What do I mean perfectly fulfills? Christ's fulfillment of Isaiah 7 goes beyond anything that we can imagine. His perfect fulfillment bears out implications not just for Ahaz and Judah, but implications that we reap the benefits of this perfect fulfillment today. Christ's fulfillment of the prophecy not only means that God dwells with his people, but he perfectly dwells with his people. Unlike the Old Testament, God's dwelling in Christ was not just seen in smoke or fire or tent or tabernacle, but in the flesh of man. God's dwelling 
moved to the incarnate flesh to be with us. God personally dwells with his people. And God doesn't just leave it at that, at the incarnation. For after Christ died, was raised from the dead, and ascended to the right hand of the Father, God's Spirit descended and indwells in us. God's presence is with his people. For the believer, for the Christian, the sign of Emmanuel perfectly represents God's indwelling presence, calming our fears, calling us to faith, and is a display of his faithfulness. Because of the sign of Emmanuel, because of the incarnation, Jesus calms our fears in perfect solitude. The creator of the universe calms the stormy waters, commands the seas, and grants us peace like nothing else. No one else can provide this. He calls us to peace, to come to him, and we find our perfect rest. Rest from the fears and tribulations of this life. Do not fear. Because of the sign of Emmanuel, because of the incarnation, Jesus calls us to faith in perfect obedience Instead of trusting in our own work, we are able to trust in Christ's work. Instead of turning to our own devices, we can turn to the incarnate King for our safety. Christ perfectly calls us to faith and to put our trust in his work. His call, his call to faith is irresistible. Because of the sign of Emmanuel, because of the incarnation, Jesus displays the faithfulness of God in perfect sacrifice. The sign of Emmanuel was a sign of God's presence, and it pointed to God's faithfulness to deliver his people. Brothers and sisters, Christ, our Emmanuel, displays God's perfect faithfulness to deliver his people as he bore our sins on the cross. Christ's perfect sacrifice displays God's steadfast faithfulness to deliver his people. God gives the sign of Emmanuel to declare his presence with his people. That's the thesis of of this passage. It's the thesis that we run with. Brothers and sisters, the, the sign of Emmanuel was not just given to Judah. We know that because of how Matthew uses it. It wasn't just a sign to show God's faithfulness at one point in time. But in Jesus, the sign of Emmanuel shows God's faithfulness to all times, in all times. This Christmas season, as we celebrate the incarnation, and we sing songs that sing of Emmanuel, we know that it calls us to place our trust and our faith in the incarnate King, Jesus. The sign of Emmanuel, the incarnation, points to God's perfect presence with his people and his perfect faithfulness. Have you contemplated how Emmanuel, how the incarnation impacts, affects your life? Let me ask you this. Are you living in a place of fear like Judah, where your hearts waver like trees in the wind? Here's your exhortation. Look to Jesus. Are you trusting in your own deliverance, scheming ways in which you can save yourself? Are you looking to the government? Are you looking to money, jobs, or other vices to help you in this life? Here's your exhortation. Look to Jesus. God's presence provides. God's presence calms our fears. God's presence is our true hope and perfect faithfulness for deliverance. Look to Christ, Calvary. Look to Emmanuel, God in flesh dwelling with us. Don't fear. Don't fear this season. Don't fear the rest of your life. Put your trust and faith in our Lord. Put your trust and faith in Christ's work and Christ's work alone. Reflect on the incarnation this season and look to God's faithfulness in Christ on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, there's so much that we could say after studying Isaiah 7, after looking to Matthew 1. But Father, I'm just struck with gratitude. Struck with gratitude and thankfulness that even in the midst of
of your people's rebellion and disobedience from the garden until you return, that your steadfast faithfulness continues to bear out in ways in our lives that we'll never understand. Father, we thank you that you gave a sign of Emmanuel, that in your son you sent not only a son to be born, but you sent your son to be born so that we could look to him, that we could place our faith and trust in him, And ultimately, he he died for our sins, not his sins, our sins, so that we could be reconciled with you. That the barrier that separated our presence from you was removed. That in dwelling in Christ, you reconciled us through the cross. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.